she was the original Marion the Librarian in The Music Man. Leonard Bernstein wrote all those high E-flats for her in Candide. She was Broadway's ingenue of choice until she disappeared in the late 60s. And when she returned in 1975, she was one of the great cabaret artists of this or anybody's time. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic of Newsday. And our guest today is Barbara Cook, who once told a student he didn't have the life experience to sing a particular song. Barbara Cook certainly has it. Is it my imagination? Or does your voice actually get better as you get older? <laughs> is this, how is this possible? Well, I think what happens with everybody is, uh, is that your voice gets warmer, it's darker, and um, I, don't ha I, I don't have the ability to sing the very high stuff that I used to do because my voice isn't that light anymore. And also, I've been singing heavier things for the past 30 years in this work that I did with Wally Harper. Uh, so it's changed in that respect, just, just the sound. But I think uh, more than that, I have a greater ability to, to sing a song to... Um, well, people are not going to know what I mean by that. Uh, I think I have a greater ability to give myself to the song and to undress emotionally. I have more courage it than is, I used to have. It's so pure, the emotional experience at your concerts. I, uh, I don't like song stylists particularly. This is, you know, not all that interesting, except that I don't like it when people screw around with Sondheim's melodies and harmonies. Do you know, I think, sing what he wrote. You know, you're not better than he is. Sing, <laughs> sing sometimes. And you are able to bring, you sing what he wrote, and yet it's, it's yours. How do you both make it personal and continue to have the integrity of the music there? Well, um, one of the things that people have said to me um, about the Sondheim show and also about the uh, Barbara Cook's Broadway show, that second one that I've been doing most recently, is they, they believe that I approach these things as an actress and they see me doing different characters. And I think that's true, but it's not something that I, that I uh, imposed on it. It's not something that I thought, oh, that's what I should do, so I'll do that. It's just the way I approach the songs. Um, and then people told me what I was doing, if you know what I mean. Um, it didn't really surprise me, it's just I'd never thought of it that way. And I think it's true. What I what what I try to do is find what what the the composer was saying, or composers what what they were what did they want to say, what do they want to communicate, and then I try to do that. Well, you, um, I was delighted and a little surprised, I think, once to read that um, uh, your your admiration and respect for Judy Garland. And what you said then was that her songs were like plays, that she had beginnings, middles, and ends. Mm -hmm. And that's really, is, was, is that an inspiration in that way? Or? Well, I don't, um, I don't uh, feel that I'm inspired by Judy yeah. Gallon anymore. Yeah. But, but certainly okay. as a young person, yeah. that's very clearly I was. And when I first came to New York, I said to, to the teacher who really built my voice, I, when I came into the studio, I said, I want to sing like Judy Garland. He said, forget it. You'll never sound like Judy Garland because you're a soprano. And uh, I don't know. I'm lucky because most sopranos don't have much bottom to their voice, much, how can I put that? Um, they're very light, can be thin voices. And I'm lucky because... Except for the Vong Wagnerians, right? Uh, yeah. Birgit Nilsson. Um, I'm yeah. talking about popular yes, singers, sure. really. Yes, absolutely. Um, but there's a place toward the top of the staff where I get a kind of trumpety sound, and that that helps me not sound so much like a soprano. Mm -hmm. I think that people wouldn't want to hear what I do with popular songs. I hope. Um, you know, I must correct you about something. Yes, you're not alone in in believing that Leonard Bernstein wrote. Um, Glitter be gay for me. That's not true at all. He did not write that song for me. Not at all. He wrote it, and you cre and it, then you. It was part. It of was the, there when you got part there. Of the score, and uh, one of the things that I had to do and that they had to do when when they were interested in me is find out whether I could sing this song or not, because I had never done anything even remotely that difficult before. Did you ha did you have an idea? I mean, you were young. Sometimes when we're young, we we sort of do stuff without realizing how difficult they are. Oh no! You knew. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I'm just I knew very well. Well, in the beginning, yeah. I couldn't even get through it. Mm -hmm. 
I, it's you know it's like it's like um, well when you're carrying heavy bags, uh, shopping bags home from the grocery, and finally you have to sit them down because your muscles just won't do it anymore. And that's what happened with this song when I first started. I just have to stop the muscles. I didn't have the muscle strength to finish the song. So I did that kind of like you would do with lifting weights. I just, I would come home from rehearsal and I would sing it straight through twice just to build up stamina and strength. Um, it, was, it was just about the hardest thing I've ever had to do vocally. I can't imagine anything more doing Yeah, that was it. Yeah. That's the most difficult. <laughs> I grew up thinking it was Dick Cavett's theme song. This is <laughs> oh, well, was, there are words to this. Oh, yeah. uh, when um, do you think about your life in two two parts? I mean, you've really had a serial life, right? Well, and certain not my life so much, yeah. but my my career. career. Yeah, I I didn't like that when people said I was having a second career in the beginning. I I really fought against that idea because what it meant to me was that I wasn't going to do theater again. And I always held out the idea or the hope that I would do theater again. I've been asked from time to time uh, to do something, but there were things that either I wasn't interested in or my schedule wouldn't allow me to do, something like that. Um, the last show I did was in 1971, the Grasshop, the last book show I did was in 1971. And the then, grass, grass Harp? Yeah, yeah, the Grass Harp. And then when I did the two Follies concerts, in I guess it was 1985 uh, with the at um, Lincoln Center. Yeah, that was the first time I had really worked with a company, even though it was such a short time. But that was the first time in a long time, and I I really did miss that, and I do miss that. I still hold out the idea that maybe you know there'll be some theater piece that I'll want to do that it's totally want me to do. It's insane that you weren't there to create a Sondheim musical with him, doesn't? I mean, because well, it would have been nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's not too late, no. You never know. Yeah. I never say no to that. Um, you mentioned Wally Harper a little while ago. Um, this has been your, your collaborator since, since you've been doing That's the concerts. Almost 31 years. Wow. And Four months shy of 31 years. And, and um, he died. Um, he died October, October 8th. Uh, 2004. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and was it unexpected for you? Was this a shock? Well, he had been not well. And I think his friends really were very concerned about him. I know we were all very concerned about him. Uh, but death is always a surprise. <laughs> it's always a surprise. Because, you know, we, none of us ever really believes we're going to die. And death is so mysterious. Birth is it's mysterious. And um, so when it, ha when it really does happen, it's, it's surprising. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And it's so final. Oh, yeah. I remember the first few days after he died, I kept saying to myself and to, and to friends that he's not just dead. He's so dead. There was such a, a chasm left there where he had been. Huge, huge loss. Have you begun to think about creating another show without him? Is this, yes. Sure. You must. Of course. Um, and so then do you look for another accompanist who will create with you, or do you get someone to play piano and you create the show? Um, I look for both. Yeah. I look for both. I'm in the process of looking right now. I haven't, you know, made any final decisions about people, but, but I'm in the process of looking. Have you ever wanted to do one of those memoir shows like Elaine Stritch, or is this not... Well, you know, the last one I did sort of turned out to be that uh, without my planning it that way. Um, we had to get a show together very quickly for Lincoln Center. And so, it, um, once again, it had to be songs that I was kind of familiar with because I didn't have a lot of time. And they kept saying, what do you, what's the name of this show? What do you call it? What is it about? And finally, because they need to put this in their advertising, their brochures and so forth. And finally I said, you know, I don't know. All I can tell you is that, that it'll be songs uh, that are actable theater songs. That's all. And we couldn't come up with a title because we didn't really know what we were going to do. And they came up with the title of Barbara Cook's Broadway. And actually that helped me because 
originally we were just looking for wonderful songs. You know, the entire the possibilities were just almost limitless, and that's the, the that's abyss of freedom, right? Yeah. It's paralyzing. Yeah. yeah. So what happened then is I th Barbara Cook's Broadway. Well, I was on really on Broadway the fifties, sixties, and seventies. So for those two decades, the um, the yeah two two decades, no more decades than that. Anyway. Um, I looked, then I started looking in, through, in those years, and with one exception, we stuck to those years when I was active on Broadway, and we drew material from, from those years. Um, it's funny, it's exact, it is, well, I guess it is two decades, I don't know, I can't count. Uh, 51 was my first show, 71 was the last one, except for the concert, which is not really a book show. So. 51 was Flahui. Flahuli, 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 Flahuli. Yeah. Uh, Yip Harburg. Right. You same you, thing. You auditioned for the chorus and got the lead. No, I didn't audition for the chorus. They asked me to come. It's so in. much for lore. Yes. Do you know? I see. I wouldn't have been hired in the chorus because I don't read music. Uh -huh. You've got to. You know. You've got to really read to be. In, well, we don't have chorus mm -hmm. members the way we used to. Dancers now. Everybody sings, dances, and acts, and everything else. Um, I wouldn't have been hired. I didn't have enough uh, musical know-how as far as reading, reading notes goes. So anyway, um, yeah, I came in and I auditioned, and God, they had um, a bridge going over the um, orchestra pit so that you could come directly on stage from the house. And Yipper came running toward me when I finished singing threw his arms around me, and gee, I thought that's the way it's always going to be. <laughs> and uh, basically, I was pretty sure I had the role that first day. And uh, it's never happened quite that way since. You were a girl, came to New York. Okay, let's do a little bit of bio. A short little bio. Okay. Okay. Um, born in Atlanta. Right. Sang for your supper. <laughs> <laughs> Not really mm -hmm. in Atlanta. Um, of course, I sang a lot during the war. I sang at, you know, um, army camps and uh, hospitals and all that kind of thing. I'm talking about World War II now. And um, You had a radio show? Yeah, I did. It was called the Kitty Express. It was a kitty radio show, WSB, in, in Atlanta. And, uh, and did you... Did you run it? I mean, were you no, one there of was, several there were kids? Two of us. There were two kitties? There were two kitties who sort of emceed the show. Um, God, I can't think of his name. He was an announcer with uh, CBS for years. Oh, it's not important. I can't think of his name. It's important to him. I'm sure if he's watching this. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Oh, um, well, there were two ladies in Atlanta who did shows for the Moose Club, the Elks Club, all that stuff. And what happened is there were about, I guess, six girls, and we did two or three dance numbers together, and then each of us would do a little specialty. And my specialty was singing, of course. So I did all that kind of thing. And um, How did you become showbiz? Because I always sang. I always um, had a really pretty yeah. voice. But your background, your family was not? No, no. not particularly. Yeah. I mean, my, my father adored music. But nobody sang, nobody performed or played musical instruments. I said, where did this creature come from? You have these, what do you know, talent is mysterious. Uh -huh. Larynxes look alike for the most part. And they work the same. You know, they're different sizes, of course. But uh, one can sing and one can't. And we don't know why. Never figured that out. So you came here on vacation. I'll see if this is true. And well, with, and, but brought all your clothes with you because you knew you were going to stay. It was sort of vacation. Uh -huh. It wasn't vacation to me. Yeah, not in your mind. My idea was to stay. Yeah. My mother didn't really know that. We came with a friend of hers to visit the friend's brother for two weeks. And um, I stayed. And I've never, never lived in Atlanta again. Do you remember the first show you saw here? Yeah, Oklahoma. First one. <laughs> it wasn't I, a bad start. I didn't really enjoy it because... I knew that that's what I wanted to do, and yet these people seemed like gods to me up there. And I thought, how am I ever, ever going to be able to stand on stage and do that? I know I want to, 
but how will I ever be able to do it? So I was just a nervous wreck through the whole thing. I didn't completely enjoy it, if you know what I mean. And yet, almost immediately after there you were. Well, it was three years, which isn't very long. But, you know, when you're living those three years and you're very young, those three years seemed very long. I love, I love, I can't imagine, plain and fancy, you were a frisky Amish girl. Frisky. Oh, frisky. I thought, who said frisky? frisky? I, I read this, I thought, a singing, dancing Amish girl. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Was it bizarre? I don't think so. Uh huh. I don't think so. The show worked very yeah. well. It was a very sweet show. Um, early on, I mean, you were always called this ingenue, and, and from the earliest quotes, it seemed to me that you weren't, you weren't comfortable with it. Um, I have a, 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 you told some paper in, I think it was 51, it's a horrible thing being called an ingenue, but let's face it, that's what I am. Well, um, actually, so many of the roles I played were not at all mm -hmm. ingenue roles, yeah. and that it became annoying after a while. Um, because we think of an ingenue as someone who's really pretty dismissible. Yeah, cute and perky, all those things. And I felt that the work I was doing was more important than that, certainly was important to me. Um, and when you think of it, um, well, Flahuli certainly you could say that was an ingenue role. In Plain and Fancy, I was really the sort of the, uh, well, in operetta, you'd, you'd call it the soubrette, okay. the comedy role. Um, then in Music Man, I was practically a spinster. My mother was terribly afraid I was not going to get married. Uh, so that certainly was not an ingenue role. In the Candide, she was like a caricature mm -hmm. of an ingenue in the beginning, but in the production that I did with Tony Guthrie, I ended up in a, a river at the end with a big hump on my back as an old crone. Do you know? So that ain't exactly mm -hmm. your yeah. usual ingenue role, is it? Um, and when I did Oklahoma, I didn't do Laurie. I did Ada did, I did, I did yeah. the, the comedy part. Yeah. Um, when you stopped working in the theater for a while, um, there was, it was discussed recently in a 60 Minutes did a sort of wonderful feature mm -hmm. on you. And it was called The Rise and Fall and Rise Again of Barbara Cook. Yeah. Um, what happened? Well, I went through a terrible period of drinking, far too much, and um, really not being able to function very well. Um, I regret that a great deal, of course, because those years, I think, might have been um, very fruitful ones for me on stage. But um, my son, who's, who's very, uh, very good at this thinking Adam, things through, Adam, yeah, yes? he said, but mom, you know, this was your journey, and your journey has taken you to who you are now, which is pretty damn good. So he's, he's a good guy. So he there was me. this time when you were playing housewife in Long Island? Or playing mother in Long Island? Uh, well, yes, yeah. but, but it was after that that, uh, oh, was that I started drinking quite uh -huh. too much. Uh -huh. I know that, uh, that weight, is, the weight is, has been an issue both on the 60 Minutes thing and also in stories. And it must be totally boring to you already, but what, <laughs> what struck me was and it just, it got me really angry when I was go doing the research for this show. And here's, here's a piece from 1951 that's, the headline is, 1951, what are you like? A s sylph, right? Well, Lovely Barbara no, Cook. No, I wasn't actually. Oh. In Flahuli, I was a little bit overweight. Lovely Barbara Cook loses weight and gains first big part in musical. That's the headline. Yeah. Loses weight. I mean, how can women, how are we not supposed to become completely obsessed? I Look at this know. one. In, I, I'm only going to do three, I promise. Yeah. But it just, it just was boggling to me. 1975, the New York uh -huh. Post. The first sentence is, Barbara Cook got fat. And then a, and then a subhead over here. I mean, I apologize for my specie. Um, as a journalist, the subhead is 20 pounds overweight. You see, like that? 20? Uh, well, but still. Oh. A, and so then I thought, well, that's just about, tabloids, well, and that's sleazy. That's sleazy, just tabloids. And then like, I have this cur 
from this, your entry from current biography, which is like legitimate stuff, right? From 1963, and it has all these things about, you know, how your, your career was going, blah, da, da. And then it gets to, she stands just under five feet, four inches, and weighs 115 pounds. In yeah. current biography, they had to It's talk. interesting, you know, they don't do that about men, do That's they? That's my they point here. They don't. About actors, about, uh, when is the last time you, well, I guess if you get, if those guys get really overweight, they talk about it. But, but you know, the worst one of that was in 1975 when I, um, when I did the Carnegie concert and the, the beginning of this 30-year uh, second career, if you will, with Wally. Um, in the New York Times, there was a big story. There was a photograph of me weighing about 110. There's a photograph of me weighing, I don't even know what I weighed then, but it was way over 110. It was 200 and something. And, um, you know, the before and after kind of thing. And it was, it was so painful because here, and then when we did this concert, it, it made a big splash. It, legendary and concert. suddenly I was in Time Magazine, I was in Newsweek, I mean News, they all, Newsweek, yeah, Newsweek. Yeah. Yeah. I was in Newsweek, and uh, they all wanted to talk about the weight more than they wanted to talk about the work. Mm -hmm. It was very annoying to me. Yeah. It, it's okay if you want to talk about the weight, fine. But then talk about the work too. But well, they were far more interested in the weight well, than the work. Well, that's why, I mean, when I found these very early clips, why were they bothering you about it when you were a baby? It just, who the hell knows? Who the hell cares? Who the <laughs> hell knows? Anyway, I just brought them because I was incensed. So I well, I, I'm really lucky because, uh, you know, I, the, the kind of work I've been doing, it's, it's okay. Listen, who the hell wants to weigh over 200 pounds? I don't, you know, but that's the way it is right now. So I've learned to accept it and uh, put on the makeup and go out and sing. What the hell? Do you go to the theater much? Yeah. I go to opera. I, well, actually, this season, I haven't been to a hell of a lot of opera. But, um, yeah, last season, though, I, I did basically three things. I went to the opera a lot. And I, I saw Stephen's uh, uh, that wonderful production of Assassins twice. Yeah, wasn't it wonderful? Oh, it was a wonderful Whoa, production. Yeah. And then I saw Hugh Jackman 15 times. So that was mainly my theater going last year. You're exaggerating or you I'm literally I'm not so exaggerating. I counted. It was 15 times. Oh, would you like to explain why? I mean, I can guess. Well, I just thought what he did was so extraordinary and so unusual and always moving to me because every single time he let, he let us in. He opened up his arms and let us in. And that's the, one of the things I love seeing on Zen. That's what I try that's to do. That's what you do. I try to do that. Do you think if you went back to a play that it would be hard to do that? Because you're used to the, having this intimate relationship with your audience in a personal way. Well, I think it would depend on the role, of course. Of course. But, uh, but uh, I was talking to Hugh about this, and I said, I think this experience you've had this year with dealing with the audience, all of that, um, be, having to be very, very present, I think that will inform all of the work that he does afterwards. He agrees. Mm -hmm. And... Um, well, he was just, it was, it was a very, system. very unusual performance. Wonderful performance. Are most of your friends in the theater, in the arts? Um, I guess so, yeah. yeah. I don't think of it's it that group. way. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a nice group. Yeah. When you, I know that you've, you um, perform in Carlisle Club, uh, you know, Carlisle Hotel. Cafe and Carlisle. Cafe at Carlisle. And, um, and, and many of the, the cabarets. And then you also perform at Lincoln Center in the Beaumont. You've performed at Carnegie Hall. Do you have a preference in terms of, of the relationship with the audience? Um, you know, it depends. About Cafe Carlisle, I think it's probably the best cabaret room in the country. And uh, fortunately, when people come there to see me, I haven't played there in about, gosh, it must be four years now. Um, they come to listen. They don't come to, to, uh, to do business while, the, while I'm singing. And that's not always true in certain rooms. Um, so at the Carlisle, it's fine. And the, the waiters 
are very unobtrusive when they serve and so forth. Obviously, I'd rather not have them serve, but they're so good at it there that it doesn't bother me usually. Is the club world shrinking the way the theater world is? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, we still have... Well, the Carlisle, I think, is going to close after next season. I think they're talking about that. I'll be playing there next spring. Next spring. And, and this their, would be spring final. of 2005. Yeah. And then they're going to close for good? Uh, that's what I think. No. I think they're, they had planned probably to close the end of uh, 2004, oh. but um, Bobby Short said he wanted to do another year, so right. they're staying open right. another year. Look, maybe I'm wrong. I hope they don't close it, but that's what I've been hearing, that they do plan to do that. They have new owners, of course, at the Carlisle. And, and when you, um, if you could, if you could think of like exactly what you would be doing next, we only have a short time, so I'm just thinking, what can we see you in next? Well, I wish I could tell you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. No. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get a new show together. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'll find a way. Every time it's, it's, you know, you think, what am I going to do now? God, it's, it's hard. Well, it's hard. Well, but it's, I'll think of something. It's been an honor to have you here. Oh, are we finished already? Yeah, I'm afraid we this are. This is so I'm afraid fast. we are. Um, thank you so much for being You're here, welcome. Barbara Cook. And thank you for being here. On behalf of the League of Professional Theater Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theater.